we practice what we preach or we try to. If you're trying to go find a mentor and you're trying to learn from somebody more experienced, then find somebody that you align with, with their worldview, and you know that they have better business than you do. And then through investigation, by open-ended questions, watching them on social media, uh, organic conversations that you have with them, try to identify an area that they maybe need help on that you could fill. And then offer to fill it And it doesn't always have to be monetary. Like you said, you are getting value back by getting, you know, sincere feedback uh, and a a way of calculating how you would charge this in the future, getting an understanding of what the process includes when you do sign up to do this for somebody. But it wasn't all monetary. And you said at the end, you know, you'd negotiated what you'd get paid. And that's a, a learning lesson for a lot of people. If you're trying to get a mentor, you know, you may be forfeiting some of your financial benefit. Welcome back to the Pursuit of Property podcast. I am joined today with my co-host, Cade Barrett. Cade, good morning. How are you feeling? Dude, it's funny. Oh, we are still morning. It feels so weird for, yeah. for uh, everybody listening. We are now recording our podcast different day and different time. So it feels a little funky right now, but we're going to get into a good groove. Hopefully have a good episode for you guys. Feeling good. I know uh, we also have had a couple breaks uh, with the podcast, just some funky schedules, me being out of town, you soon to be out of town, holidays. So trying to get uh, some good episodes put together uh, and not have any hiccups in content, which I think uh, we are on schedule and on track to do so. Yeah. And you're you're partway through a fast. Yeah. How are you feeling two days in? Well, I have... uh, I will say... The first a uh, little bit past two days now, up until basically the two day mark was really freaking tough. I think it was exacerbated by also not feeling well. Matt, my bad. Uh, <laughs> thank uh, I can thank uh, you for that. Um, mm-hmm. Feeling a little sick. I think that just brought out the hunger a little more. But now feeling a lot better today, sickness wise, uh, at least now that we've got a couple hours under the morning and Hunger is not there right now, so hmm. we will see. Uh, we'll see how the next two days go. But that's why, the goal. Why are you doing a fast? We've talked about it uh, in passing before. I have also wanted to do one uh, for probably the same amount of time. We've talked about it. I don't know, a month, couple months. Um, just have not had the discipline <laughs> to find uh, to really tell myself I'm going to set aside these couple days to do it. Uh, And I just said, I need to quit being a little bitch. I need to tell myself the days I'm going to do it. Uh, And woke up on Sunday uh, before I wasn't feeling well. And I was like, screw it. The only lunch appointment this week that I have is not till Thursday. So I was like, boom, we're just going to do it. Let's go. Hmm. And what do you do with all your extra free time now that you're not making dinners and lunches and breakfasts? Closing extra deals? Dude, well... No. Trying to uh, work on some extra deals now uh, that we've got uh, the focus of this episode we're going to talk about. So, yeah, it's been good. Um, filling days with work, trying to uh, chip away at some at some rocks and, and move move the needle yeah. for us. And I think it's going to be a good Q1. Yeah, it's already been a great Q1. Let's talk. You have some big news to announce both to the listeners and to just friends and family um, about kind of what you're doing nowadays. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what you did at the end of last year. What, yeah. were you, what was your work like at the end of last year? End of last year, um, there was really no organization to the chaos. And, and I pride myself on trying to be as organized with our calendar and our schedule and just really trying to stay focused. But... Um, last quarter of last year was kind of chaotic. Um, I started and got off the ground. Uh, I, I guess you could call it a consulting gig that I started to do, uh, with some local investors here in the central Valley. Um, just finding ways to 
create deals that maybe weren't property specific, right? Obviously, we've been in the business, you know, now five plus years. And uh, for anyone who's read Rocket Fuel, you know, you've got Visionary, you've got Integrator. I definitely lean more heavy on the Integrator side uh, with skills and what I enjoy doing, being more on the operations side of the business. So I was taking that value and uh, pouring that and providing that to some clients here in the Central Valley, which was awesome. And it was good. Uh, I think it helped solidify, uh, again, kind of what I know I'm good at and kind of what I want to be doing on a day-to-day basis. Um, obviously, I'm still a licensed agent. Uh, have a, had one or two retail deals closed in Q4 of last year, so was still working the retail side a little bit. Um, and then January comes around. And one of the clients that I actually did some consulting for uh, was Jason Pritchard and the Pinnacle team here in Fresno, the team that you have been a part of since last April, Yep, running acquisitions, directing acquisitions uh, for, for their team. And um, I was helping you guys get migrated and set up and moved over to a new CRM system, Resimply which not all the kinks are figured out, but we've got at least the baseline now in there and are continuing to work through that. And it kind of came full circle after that. So I was kind of, again, doing some one-on-one consulting uh, for Jason and for you guys at the Pinnacle team moving the CRM over. And it just became a mutual discussion between Jason and I uh, as to if I would be interested in a more permanent position on the team uh, being the director of operations, kind of the flip side of the coin of, you know, yeah. kind of your heads, I'm tails, kind of the flip side of the coin there. Um, and so after working that and walking through that conversation a little bit more, uh, it was a little after January, one, I think it was January 2nd, um, started officially as the director of operations for, uh, for Pinnacle Investments here in Fresno. Dude, it was a big addition. Um at our rock meeting talking in December about what we wanted to do in 2024, it became apparent that in order to hit our goal, we needed more people helping. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting the way that kind of the, the dominoes fell and it worked out in a way that I feel like is beneficial. Um, and I think that, like you said, it's kind of like coming full circle. You and I both worked with Clayson at the start of the, the journey, now we're both with Pinnacle, which still is Jason. Um, yeah. Now, the purpose of this pod isn't to um, necessarily just talk about where we ended up, but to talk more about how you ended up there and talking about kind of what you've done leading into getting that position and creating that, you know, I guess, win-win. Yeah, I think, it, I think our discussion in today's episode will be a really good build off. We had a episode uh, a couple episodes ago where we did teams versus solopreneur. And I think building on that discussion and kind of sharing how this kind of came full circle, I think this will be a good add on to that. But obviously, right, you mentioned the full circle moment. We started in the business uh, under the Clayson group, which was led by, like you mentioned, Jason and Benny, Jason, obviously the owner of Pinnacle, who we are now with after five years, right? But we were part of the team for... uh, I was a little bit less than you because I came on after, but two, three Mm -hmm. years-ish. After that, um, when the team kind of mutually decided to each go our own ways, we kind of went and did the solopreneur thing, right? Um, We did have our joint venture and our uh, LLC for our rentals out of state, right? But outside of that, we were trying to run our own businesses, both retail and investments, right? So working, uh, working on our own, trying to, you know, put marketing systems in place through lead generation, calling those leads, going out on appointments to try and close the leads, signing deals, closing escrows, right? And we did that for a little while. And then uh, last, this was last year, end of Q2. uh, So maybe early, early summer, 
Um, I was in talks with a team out of Tulare to go and provide some, you know, uh, some of the similar things that I am now uh, providing with my role with Pinnacle. But after that solopreneur run, we've talked about it before and we're not going to be redundant. But I was in a place where I was like, dude, this is just not fun for me anymore. I don't like you you hit the nail on the head when saying, right? I don't want to be the decision maker for everything in my in my business. I don't want to be wearing all these hats. I want to wear the hat that I'm good at and I want to go and be around people that I enjoy working with who can wear the other hats and the synergy energy is there and you can basically turn your your day from a miserable work day to an enjoyable work day, right? So I was in that position. I know you were in a similar one. And I had a little bit of a stint uh, with a team out in Tulare providing a little bit of operational consulting uh, direction to their retail and investment business. That was really cool because I got to start to do some of the things I knew I was really good at. I was also surrounded by a great group of people, many of whom I'm still friends with and and doing things with today, right? But um, that stint only lasted a couple months before, again, kind of the team went through something similar with Clayson. Everybody kind of went and did their own thing. So now here I am back to, you know, quote unquote, a solopreneur. That's where, like you had asked in Q4, I start to take what I provided um, or, or some of the skill set I knew I had on the operations and integration side to then offer that to maybe some other investors, uh, real estate professionals in the Valley who had a need for those. And I think it was after having that conversation with Jason, starting to provide that consulting services to move CRMs and direct that process... Um, uh, it was kind of a no-brainer for me when that discussion turned into becoming something more and and full-time. I knew, obviously, we have great working synergy. We knew that... Uh, or I knew that I had great working synergy with Jason from a couple years ago getting started. Obviously, uh, one of the two mentors I started with in this business and owe everything uh, to for her, basically everything we've learned and how we've gotten here. So... That is the long story short-ish on uh, how we came full circle and kind of the reasoning and stuff happening behind the scenes to get to, you know, where we are now. Yeah. I want to kind of touch on that whole bringing value. Um, When you came first to talk with Jason, it wasn't asking for any kind of long-term position. No. And I don't know if the intention was even there for it. It seemed like your intention was to bring the value that you could bring um, to an already successful team that maybe didn't have the skill set already to do that. Yeah. And that mainly came from you. I know you sharing like, hey, you know, we're dealing with some issues on the acquisition side that deals, you know, with operations and some of these things where there's, you know, stuff falling through the cracks. There's kind of some gaping holes. And it was like, dude, I know Jason said, um, you know, we need to get some of these issues fixed. So yeah, it, that's a great clarification. I mean, to start, it was truly like a, Hey, I know you guys have some issues that need to be solved. Um, you know, I'm kind of getting this consulting thing off the ground and helping some, you know, investors and real estate professionals in town, fill those cracks and fill holes in their business that deal with the operation side. And so that that's what it truly started out as, which was really cool. Cause even then I got to still get a, get a taste of how it was like working through uh, some issues and working with you, working with Jason, working with some members of the team. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, it's, it's bringing value before you reap any massive benefit. I mean, the consulting thing that you did was not any kind of reoccurring income. It was a one time, you know, make some money now for yeah. work that you did. It was exchanging time for money. Yeah. And I think we always talk about if you want to have a good relationship with uh, any kind of mentor, any kind of person that maybe knows more than you in this business, the best thing you can do is identify something that you can do that they can't, go to them and say, I will do it and start that process. 
Well, and that's a great point, and I'll build on top of that um, too. But I know we both hate, and you hear it from many people in the industry, is never go and say, hey, can we grab lunch? Or, hey, are you open to you know, meeting me? And, and can I take you to lunch? Can I pay for your lunch, right? It's, can I pick your brain? Can I pick your brain, dude? Oh, my gosh. You start and you hit the nail on the head with providing value. You need a value add in there, whether you're cold reaching out to someone on social media, whether uh, you're trying to reach out and maybe build a mentorship or some kind of you know, coaching figure where, you're, where you are locally. There has to be a value add. And what I did with Jason was I was like, dude, I don't want to be paid up front. I don't even want to agree on what you're going to pay me to go and do this. I said, look, I am going to go. I'm going to get this CRM migration done. And then at the end, I want you to pay me what you feel that work was worth and and what you think was fair. So I did not set a price. I did not want to be paid anything up front. I only wanted to be paid on the deliverance of the project and for what the client thought it was worth. Now, Don't do that with everybody. Don't do that with everybody. I was going to say, looking on the outside in, that's a horrible, horrible negotiation uh, tactic, right? But the reason I approached it that way is because there was a prior relationship there. There was all of the trust in the world already built between, you know, the two of us, right? And in my eyes, I wanted to be like, look, I just want to be able to provide value. I want to be able to get truthful insight on, okay, you know, you were a client of my consulting thing. You know, what are some things I could change? What could be different? And just to get a better idea of, okay, this activity, what's it's really, what is it really worth kind of quote unquote as an hourly wage if I were to break it down after he pays me? So again, yeah, great um, highlight there. Not, do not do that in every, in every circumstance. The scenario here made it possible, but all comes down to, like you said, finding a way to provide value. Yeah. And even with the prior relationship there, it wasn't like, oh, I'm just going to go and, and hire K just because I know, uh, you know, I've known him before, right? It's showing your resume, showing your track record of success with within the, you know, areas that you might be struggling with in your business and then providing that value. Yeah. You know, for me, it was, is obviously, the, like you said, it's the opposite side of the coin. Uh, going to to Jason and saying, hey, you know, these are the things I don't want to deal with, but I will take over doing all these things. And um, it's a little different because Jason likes doing acquisitions, but uh, he had so many different pressing problems and not problems, but opportunities, I should say, to make other decisions in other places. It made sense for me to say, hey, why don't I come join your team? I'll handle that stuff. You don't worry about it as much you go do bigger picture things or other opportunities. So again, we practice what we preach or we try to. If you're trying to go find a mentor and you're trying to learn from somebody more experienced, then find somebody that you align with, with their worldview, and you know that they have better business than you do. And then through investigation by open-ended questions, watching them on social media, uh, organic conversations that you have with them, Try to identify an area that they maybe need help on that you could fill and then offer to fill it. And it doesn't always have to be monetary. Like you said, you are getting value back by getting, you know, sincere feedback uh, and a, a way of calculating how you would charge this in the future, getting an understanding of what the process includes when you do sign up to do this for somebody. But it wasn't all monetary. And you said at the end, you know, you'd negotiated what you'd get paid. And that's a, a learning lesson for a lot of people. If you're trying to get a mentor, you know you may be forfeiting some of your financial benefit. And Absolutely. yeah, I've had to find uh, financially take a, a step back from what I was making as a solopreneur, and that's okay because it's not all of my benefits from this deal come strictly from a financial standpoint. Yeah, I think buying into, um, and you guys can go back and listen to this Teams versus Solopreneur podcast for a more in depth discussion, but it's more, at least for me, a big, a big point of contention was I had already come to terms, right, of not wanting to do things on my own. And I think what made 
pinnacle and working with you guys so appealing was obviously one we talked about it the prior relationship or and current relationship right but two being bought in to the company and its people with the vision of where we want to go and just knowing that the ride there and the value we can both provide in order to get us from a to b is going to be a hell of a lot of fun and it's you know and we know it's only up from here ideally Right. And so I think that was a big piece of it, knowing the vision and the mission and the people and knowing that, you know, the next couple of years are going to be bonkers. Yeah, I, that's where I wanted to lead into is that 2023 was a very, very hard year for a lot of people, including myself. It was a huge year of changing expectations. I think That being said, our conversation with David Keller last podcast is a great example that the perception of the market is shifting and it's shifting rapidly. And if 2024 turns out to go as well as we're expecting, you know, we need extra hands doing extra things. So when people think of a solopreneur in real estate, they think of my job. They think a lot about the guy going, getting the deals, they're on social media, They're the ones, you know, wholesaling properties and X, Y, and Z. But let's talk about the tasks that maybe were falling through the cracks with us, even at the volume of 20 to 25 houses at a time, which we've averaged now for a few months. Like, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And this goes back to rocket fuel. The integrator's role is often not seen, but that need to get done in order for the business to be profitable. So let's talk a little bit about kind of some of the tasks. Ideally, you know, people listening are going to hear this and say, well, am I doing that? Can I do it? And if I can't, who should I look to for advice on how to do it? Yeah. So essentially, I'll kind of break down um, kind of what the quote unquote director of, of operations, kind of what I am doing. Um, starting with one is organizing and bringing harmony to our data management and that encompasses a lot of things. It's one, continuing to get our CRM dialed in, uh, not only working directly with the CRM company, but also, okay, now all of our stuff is in the CRM. Now, where do things go? When do they need to go there? How do we get them there? How do we delineate all of the information we need within a lead within the CRM, right? So it's all the gears and turning parts and the intricacies that go into that CRM piece. The next piece under data, that data management umbrella is the pulling of lists that we are marketing to, whether it's direct mail, cold calling, et cetera, right? So it's one, the data we're pulling, where it's being stored, how often we're pulling new data, how frequently should we be mailing new data, and how do we bring that organization in harmony to all of that thousands and thousands and thousands pieces of data that is right now currently thrown up across God knows however many spreadsheets across all different places, right? So it's, and that's, you know, work in progress. One of, you know, what we've yeah. called one of the Q1 rocks um, for me is how do we rein in all of these floaters where all of these things are housed and put them under one roof and have that be dialed in and organized. Mm-hmm. The flip side is the project management piece. So at Pinnacle, we do have a kick-ass project manager. His name's Nakia. Essentially, I am working in tangent with Nakia. And what that means is he is more hands-on at our current projects and our current properties. But now my role is working with our accountants and our contractors to be able to take a bid and a project from start to finish and be more in tune of how to keep projects more cost effective and true to our original bid. Yeah. And so that that is one building the relationships with our existing contractors. It's two working with our accountants to see okay, where are we at on a given project to be able to communicate that to our contractor, right? Because you know, if you're working on a project, you may have the original bid, but if you're not keeping track of what you've already spent on the project, how are you going to know if you're way over budget, under budget, right on budget, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, 
again, it's it's a lot of these moving pieces and gears that you said that happen behind the scenes of a house flip or, you know, kind of going out and taking something from start to finish. Yeah. Um, there's a few other processes there helping with our accountant, which is bringing harmony to our private lender process. Um, anytime we bring on a new private lender on a project or, you know, somebody who may have been investing with us for a while, how do we make their quote unquote client experience uh, really awesome from start to pen- start to finish, excuse me. So a lot of it financial based working in tangent with our accountant to work on financials behind the scenes for projects, both active and closed and uh, data management piece. And then also working that project management management piece in tangent with our project manager and our contractors. It's kind of interesting. I just thought of this analogy while you were, you kept using the word harmony and I was like, for some reason, obviously, I went to like musical. And I was thinking about it. A business like ours operates, you know, in in, seg- in segments, I would say. There's a marketing, acquisitions, operations, sales. That That marketing piece, the data management, if you start off on the wrong note, your whole process is off, right? You could still play the notes, but if you're in the wrong key, it's still wrong. And uh, getting that in line is really important. You know, when you look, when you read sheet music, that first uh, symbol is about which key you're playing in. And if you can't read that or understand that, then it doesn't matter if you can read sheet music and you can do all the steps. It's just not going to start right. I think fucking phenomenal analogy. (laughs) I I thought so too, but it gets better. Continuing this way, acquisitions is that whole first verse that leads up to the chorus. Again. Just like getting the key right, if you start on the wrong note or the wrong, uh, uh, why am I thinking of the word, Um, beat, you know, again, you can still get it all right, but it's still off. So your job is getting, helping make sure that we're playing in the right key here. I take over on making sure we start on the right note and making it all the way to that chorus. And that first chorus is getting that contract signed. Boom. And at that point, that's when you step in again. And that handoff has to be smooth. So making sure that, like you kept using that word harmony, making sure that 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 conversation, that that transaction is smoothly handed over into the chorus where the majority of people are going to remember. That's the actual flipping, right? That's the Instagram stories. These are our contracts going. Look at this. Look at that. That's the flashy part. Nobody remembers the first verse or second verse or third verse. Yeah. You get to the, the... that second verse, that's really a lot to do with managing financials. And this is why I'm not a good flipper. I'm a great wholesaler, great investor, not a great flipper. Because dealing with an accountant and contractors and numbers and making sure you're staying in budget is not my skill set. My skill set is talking to, to people. That's what I do. But that's still paramount. Because if you get off track there, again, there's another course coming when you come to list a home and sell it to the end buyer and reap your profits at the end. So this whole idea of it being kind of like a song and making sure each portion is starting and stopping in the right key at the right time, repeatable, that's a skill set in its own. And uh, you know, if you're somebody like me, you could do one or two deals at a time because it's easy to kind of process keeping that all in line. But if you want to be doing 20, 40, 100 houses a month, um, you have to have a repeatable process and you have to have a metronome that's keeping you on time. And you have to have somebody at the start who's able to read the music and start it off on the right note. Because if we're not doing that stuff, then you're kind of banking on luck. And Dude, and, and that's po- that's it. In the podcast right there, bro. That's freaking mic drop. Go listen, rewind, listen to that shit over again. That it's a is, long that analogy, phenomenal. but I think that that makes a lot of sense to me when you kept using that word harmony. That is what you're bringing. It's a sense of consistency and flow through the entire process. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and again, this is, I, I'm going to bounce back to that first episode we did because there's not one right way to do it. We came full circle to both understand and recognize we did not want to be the solo guy doing this on our own or trying to build out uh, everything underneath us, right? That's not to say that that option, of course, there are successful people 
who are doing that and and would rather go that route than try to find and bring harmony in whatever aspect of of business to an existing uh, company or team, right? So I think that's the important distinction just to reiterate. There's no right or wrong way to go about it. I think if there's any message that this that I, I'm wanting to bring from kind of how this went full circle is you need to figure out one, what you like to do. Yeah. Two, what you are good at doing. And three, do you want to try and be the business owner and build it out yourself? Or do you want to go and work and provide that value to a, maybe an already existing company and grow, you know, together with them? It's not that there's a right or a wrong. Do you want to be the orchestrator or do you want to be the musician in one of the seats? Yeah. It, it There is no... Just because there is only one orchestrator doesn't mean that that's the only position that is considered amazing. If you're first trumpet, you're first trumpet. That's just how it goes. Yeah. And I think it's important to know as well that us describing that process tells you how many different pieces of the puzzle there are. And there's not just like one or two options. There's hundreds of roles in, in a company that flips homes, right? And as an investor. Both. And try both because we, like we said, we're five plus years in. Try both, do both. It's just because. Not both. Try everything. <laughs> yeah, literally go and, dude, some people, I mean, when you think about it, freaking five years, that's freaking crazy. It's gone by so freaking fast. But it's like, dude, now, especially for the majority of people who listen and watch our podcast, uh, for those of you guys who are still relatively younger, young adults, you have the time to go and try everything. You owe it to yourself to go and try everything to, again, one, figure out what do you like to do? What are you good at? What avenue or what vehicle do you want to put those things into to get you to where you want to be? And every job is going to come with a lot of great things and a lot of bad things. Like I can say for my job, the benefit is my job is really exciting. The downside is I'm always on call and it always seems to be an emergency. That's just, it's, you have to learn to live with certain things. But like you're saying, you got to go try it to figure out what job gives me more benefits in my head than it does downside. Yeah. So go try being uh, an acquisitions person. Go try talking to sellers. See if you're good at it. See if you like it. Give it six months to a year. See what happens. You may be good. You may not. And if you're not, then say, you know what? I learned that that's not the right fit. Let's try doing maybe more of the project management or let's try doing financials or let's try doing uh, realtor or loan officer sales. There's so many different aspects of our business that still get you into the real estate sphere that don't require one set of skills. 100%. But let's talk about the people that like actually run the business and own the business. Yeah. I think the thing that's been most prevalent to me is the the people that run successful businesses that, you know, run something big, they all seem so calm when it is always chaotic around them. You know, like off top of the head, like Dean, Jason, uh, Armando, these guys that are doing a lot of deals, they always have a reason to have panic and they never are. Maybe you notice that you're not great at certain things, but that's a skill you realize like, hey, I'm constantly surrounded by issues and it doesn't overwhelm me and it, it is what it is and it's like a game. That might be the sign that you're the right person to run the business. And if that's the case, learn to hire, right? Yeah. <laughs> like that's the only role that you can't just like go and talk to another investor and say, can I just take your job as the owner? <laughs> I mean, there, there are people that will do it, but like it's pretty rare. Yeah. If you realize that that's your skill set, maybe you're not the best at talking to people. Maybe you're not the best financial person but you're really good at making decisions when everybody else is stressed out and can't, maybe that's your sign that your job is the owner. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't have that skill set, I do not currently have the ability to be around constant mayhem and not let it get to me. <laughs> that's your sign that maybe you shouldn't be the owner right now. And like you said, you're young. You have time to try other things. You still can grow into that role, but don't try to force something that maybe isn't always the best fit. Well, and that's that's a key distinction too. You said right now, right? A lot of us want want what we want now when it's so so far away, right? And I think 
there's an aspect and there's something to be said about one, not only paying your dues, quote unquote, so to speak, but two, it that's not to restrict you from ever getting there, from ever getting like you look at us, quote unquote, we are the owners and decision makers, but not for Pinnacle. We're the owners and decision makers for our rental company, Early Bird, Early Bird Investments, right? So we still have an aspect of that ownership and that decision making. It's just not in our full day to day. You know what I mean? So there's, it's not like there can't be overlap, that there's never going to be overlap, that you have to pick one and start there and can't ever make the switch or grow into something else. It, that is completely not the case. Yeah. And going back to, to this whole purpose of like, identifying ways to give value. Don't underestimate the value of being happy at a job. How many people got into real estate because they weren't happy at their last job? If you're not happy at this job, then you're not fulfilling your main purpose, which was to do something that you like to do. And so just like you're saying, just because you moved into this doesn't mean you have to stay into this one pocket of the, the world. You know, we always say real estate's just an asset for investing. There's so many different ways to invest. And so you can also try other things. Take what you're learning from the real estate people and just understand that all of this is applicable other places. If you're in a current role in a nine to five and you don't love it, but you realize that there's holes in that business that you could help fill, what do you have to lose from pitching it? That, hey, I see this big issue I'm currently doing this role that's maybe replaceable that I don't love and I would want to take over and build this to something bigger. It doesn't matter if you're at Tesla or Amazon. I mean, you're building something. Take joy in just building something. That's the last key piece I wanted to share too is you have to put it out there, right? For some like and for me it was okay, I had checked the boxes of, you know, again, knowing what I like to do and knowing what I'm good at. Now, for that last piece, it's finding what vehicle I want to put those things in and run with it. I had to be vocal about those two things. I had to be vocal with people about what I like to do and what I'm good at. And the vehicle was, I now want to be able to do that for you in your business in some areas that may be lacking. But I had to be vocal about it. You had to go out. I had to go out and network, talk to people. There's something to be said about the good old-fashioned networking piece and, and shooting your shot when you may be reserved or too nervous or too scared to do so. Fuck it. Go and fucking do it, dude. Ask and you shall <laughs> receive. That, that, I mean, yeah. that statement has some real meaning. Like if you don't go and ask that person that you want to mentor you, they're not going to realize that that's what you want. And you have no clue what problems they're dealing with because you only see the very best on social media. And I heard this actually at my Wednesday morning meeting that I tell you about. And it's all about, you know, faith and, and actually like religious stuff. But a lot of it's applicable everywhere. And it's like social media is you seeing the best of other people's lives and comparing it to the worst of yours. So just because that person has a successful business doesn't mean that they don't have problems. Go ask them. Say, hey, these are the things that I have going right for me and I'd like to try to bring value. Do Does that resonate with you at all? Are there problems that you could see being filled from that? Don't leave the onus on them. Give them an idea of what you want to do or help with and then go from there. And I don't mean to poo-poo on this. It doesn't mean go out and ask like, hey, can I help with your social media? Oh, can I can I uh, send you leads? You're always going to get a yes for that. Bring something that's more <laughs> impactful, like what Cade's saying. Maybe they have a, a massive set of data and they don't know how to organize it. And you have a background that allows you to help organize it. Come to an agreement and say, why don't I help you organize this? And in, re in return, I can learn some stuff from you. I think that's more impactful. And the bigger impact you can make on a business the more you're going to get in return, right? Reciprocity takes hold. And if the person's not being reciprocal, uh, maybe you don't want to work with them. Yeah. And it's important to keep in mind for anybody who may have the excuse ready of, oh, I don't know what I'm good at. I'm not good Ooh. at particularly anything specific, right? Each and every single one of us have value to provide. If you don't know what that is yet, you either A, haven't spent enough time 
in the trenches, hands on figuring out what you're really good at. And by figuring it out, failing forward, yes. trying, failing, trying again. And two, you haven't spent enough time to really reflect and do some thought on what you enjoy doing because each, again, each and every one of us has value to provide, but you need to spend the time to figure out A, what you're good at and B, what you enjoy doing. You just, if you don't know either of those things yet, you just haven't spent enough time failing forward. Spend enough time in the trenches talking, networking with people. And that cleared, like, dude, it took freaking over three before I kind of really got a grasp. And I don't know what yours was for you, but it took me th- years to figure that out. It doesn't happen at the snap of your fingers. It can take years to figure out what that is. But once you do, Figure out the vehicle you want to put those in and run with it. Yeah. And I guess if you're if you're scared about wasting your time trying things that you're going to fail at, think about the time you're wasting not starting now. Because this is the only process to learn what you're good at. You know, we talked about it in that personal uh, financial episode that if you're not putting money away now, then you're just setting yourself up for failure. And people may say, well, putting money away now, what if I put it in a savings account and I should have put it in an investment or done this. I mean, you're still worse off not doing anything. And so go try something, especially if you're in a job that you don't like. This is like one of the things I hear all the time from people that want to get in the business. It almost always starts with, I'm at this job that I hate. What are you doing outside your job to start something new? Because if you're not doing anything and you're just hating on it, it's not enough pain yet for you to have taken action you're not there yet. And so you're either going to get to the point where you hate that job so much that the sacrifice of spending your weekends and evenings doing something else uh, is so easy because you're so upset with the job and that's when you're going to make the switch or it won't get there and you're just going to work through that job and you're always going to hate it. And we've had some great guests who have gone through starting, you know, they've been in the nine to five. Jacob Jacob as a nurse. Miguel Miguel. Sanchez is another one. Like, guys, we have so many people. I, I, I've, Casey Hammond. Casey Hammond. I pride, we pride ourselves on bringing high value quality guests onto the show and to provide stories and content that will be relatable. Go and listen to some of those stories because I guarantee you'll pull nuggets from there. And if you listen to any of those guys, you're going to hear that they did the exact same thing that we're saying. Um, you know, Casey went and worked as uh you know like an apprentice he was doing cabinets as an Mm -hmm. apprentice and 10 years later he runs a very successful construction company he drives a c6 corvette (laughs) or c8 corvette you know living his best life still playing in a rock band you know you look at jacob paid his way all the way through nursing school starts nursing hates it and drops it did he seem upset he didn't seem upset to me because he's doing something he likes now yeah same with miguel doing you know, he was a paramedic. a paramedic working for a big company, learned how to sell homes on the side, then became a salesperson. Now is flipping homes, owns a recycling business. Those are the stories of people that they get to the point where it's so much, they make a decision that they're going to try something new. Most of them learn from somebody else and then start their business. That's it. Guys, Dude. what a pod. Cade, it is great to have you on the team. It's good to share how you got here because it was a perfect example of what we preach. And uh, like you said, there was no prior intention. These things work out. And we know that if you provide value, it, whatever will happen will happen for the best. Absolutely. Dude, thank you. Thank you to everybody who's listening and watching right now. If you guys are in that position of you know, kind of having that chaos there's really no harmony to your workday or maybe where you are personally or professionally. You guys know that we are always available. Please reach out if there's any value we can provide. Um, we, we've got a little bit of time on our belts in, in the business now. And, and what I hope is some good advice and clarity that we can provide as well. So reach out. Always, uh, We are always available and open and go back, listen to some of these stories of these people that we talked about. Their social medias are also in the description there if any one of them resonates with you uh, a little more. So, sweet. All right, guys. We will see you next week for the next episode of the Pursuit of Property podcast.